Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce Dr. Jean Hogarth, who's serving as the Helen LeBaron Hilton Endowed Chair for the College of Human Sciences for this year. The Helen LeBaron Hilton Endowed Chair was established in 1990 and it was supported by a gift of more than $1.3 million from the estate of Helen LeBaron Hilton, who served as the Dean for the College of, Hum of uh, Home Economics, now part of the College of Human Sciences. And she served in that role from 1952 until 1975. Now, throughout her career, Dean Hilton was recognized as a visionary leader and as an advocate to advance the status of women and the well-being of children. So the Hilton Chair is selected to advance priority areas that are deemed central to our College of Human Sciences in today's world. The college, at this point, has chosen to focus on the critical issue of financial literacy. Dr. Hogarth exemplifies the characteristics of the Hilton Chair. She's a visionary leader, an excellent scholar and teacher, and a national and international leader in the field of financial capability and literacy. Jean's visit to our campus this week is the first of four weeks of visits that she'll be at Iowa State. <coughs> and during those four weeks, she will work with faculty, students, and state leaders, visiting classes, speaking at several conferences, and working with faculty to enhance teaching, research, and outreach efforts. And these weeks are going to be spread throughout the year. So she's here this week. She'll be back in November, and then she'll be back here two times in the spring. Dr. Hogarth is currently manager for consumer education and research section of the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs at the Federal Reserve. <coughs> she joined the reserve in 1995. Her previous experience includes seven years of high school teaching, a year on cooperative extension at, on, as a faculty member at the University of Illinois, and 13 years on the consumer economics faculty at Cornell University. Now at the Federal Reserve, she is responsible for research and outreach initiatives related to consumer financial services. Dr. Hogarth <coughs> is the author of numerous scholarly research articles as well as consumer education resources on financial management. Both her research and her consumer education programs have received awards for their excellence. For example, she's the recipient of the Association for Financial Counseling and Planning Education, Mary Ellen Edinson Educator Award, and she was named a mentor and distinguished fellow by the American Council on Consumer Interests. And these are just a few of her awards and efforts. Dr. Hogarth serves on several editorial boards of professional journals and served as the co-editor of the 2008 Journal of Consumer Affairs that focused on financial literacy. She also serves on the advisory board for the Villanova University Center for Marketing and Public Policy, the University of Arizona's Research Advisory Council, for the Take Charge America Institute for Consumer Financial Education and Research, and the National Forum to Promote Low-Income Household Savings. Dr. Hobart received a BS in education from Golden Green State University and both her MS and PhD in Family and Consumer Economics from the Ohio State University. Dr. Hobart's topic for this evening is taking control of your financial future in tough times. Now, following her remarks, of course, we will take time for questions, and we then would invite you to join us for refreshments after she's done. So, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hogarth. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Um, I am both 
um, honored and humbled to uh, be here this evening. Um, uh, Dean White told you a little bit about Helen Baron Hilton. Let me tell you just a little bit more. Um, Dr. Hilton received her bachelor's degree from the University of Vermont, her master's from Cornell, where I spent a chunk of my time, and her PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, she led the school from being a department to being a college in her years here at Iowa State. She survived a visit from Nikita Khrushchev in 1959, so we're, 50, we're at the 50 year anniversary of that visit, um, as well as campus turmoils in the 60s and 70s. And as someone who was on the campuses in the 60s and the 70s, I can say that that's, that's no mean accomplishment. Something that you might not know was that she was the first female city council member in Ames, Iowa. And um, she encouraged women to take an active interest in getting involved in policies that affected their families and their lives. I really love this quote from her that I have up there because I think it is as applicable in 2009 as it was in um, 1961. So again, I, I want to recognize the great honor of, of being this year's Helen O'Baron Hilton Chair. Let me give you another quote. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. Does this sound at all familiar to you? Does this sort of ring true today? Um, Charles Dickens married a Hogarth. Now I have to tell you that my maiden name is Hogarth, but I am married. And my husband will say to you that it explains a lot about Charles Dickens to know that he married a Hogarth. <laughs> so where are we and how tough is it if we're talking about tough times? What I want to do is share with you just some sort of status slides that sort of point out where we are. These are income trends from 1975 to 19, uh, 2008. And um, in these slides, I've used gold for the US um, figures and cardinal, I want you to notice, I did my homework, cardinal for the, um, the Iowa State figures. But you can see that Iowans um, were behind up until the mid-90s in um, income, but have, have sort of been tracking US trends recently. The most recent numbers show that um, median income right now in 2009 is down a little bit more. It's down 2.6% for whites, 2.8% for blacks, 4.4% for Asians, and 5.6% for Hispanics. So the, the, the trend is, is downward in still a little bit in, in this current day and age. <clears throat> no big surprise to many of you, unemployment rates have trended up. Iowa is lucky, and I'll put that in air quotes, that um, they're a little bit below the national average, but I know that many of you are feeling the effects of unemployment in your communities. I thought this was a fascinating slide as I developed the numbers because it shows that Iowa has been basically tracking the national trends in bankruptcy. And that big spike you see in 2005 really reflects the, the run-up in bankruptcies uh, prior to bankruptcy reform. But what is more troubling is the fact that we are trending up again from 2006 up to 2008. I don't have Iowa figures for this, but at national level, credit card delinquencies are, are hovering um, above 6%, and charge-offs in July uh, for credit cards were at 10.5%, which is a new record for credit card charge-offs. Delinquencies just simply means you're late in you're paying your bill. Charge-offs mean the credit card companies have just written you off, sold your credit card debt, or just said, no, we're not going to get any of this money back. At the national level, I'm sure many of you have been hearing about projected federal deficits. 
Um, I take a look at this slide and it really worries me to think about the implications for tax burden in the future. And I will point out that these are annual deficits. This is not cumulative. If I gave you the cumulative charge, we would all be out in the bars drinking. Um, <laughs> so the question then becomes, what happens if, um, with interest rates, if government borrowing starts to squeeze out private borrowing? What will this do to the value of the dollar internationally? And what will this mean for the future of inflation? The Federal Reserve, um, on our New York Federal Reserve website, hosts a credit conditions website that looks at a variety of statistics that focus on delinquencies. Delinquencies for auto loans, bank cards, uh, mortgages. I've put up here student loans. And then there are uh, another series of charts. And this is a heat map. The darker the area, the higher, in this case, the student loan delinquencies for, that are delinquent 90 days or more. Let me bring this a little bit closer to home. And I don't know, those of you in the front can probably see this. But um, you can mouse over a county, and it will pop that county out and give you specific information about the county. And I selected Story County for obvious reasons here. Um, the student loan delinquency rate in Story County is up 6.6% higher than it was a year ago. Um, I want to recognize that student loans are a very, very complicated product. The Federal Reserve in August just released some new rules on student loans disclosures. And we developed those by doing a lot of consumer testing. Most of our new consumer disclosures really are based on interactions with consumers, asking them what do they know, what do they want to know, what is meaningful to them, how should we display this information. And I was in a housing class yesterday where we showed them the evolution of some mortgage disclosures that we've come out with. Um, one of the things we found out about student loans is it's confusing on a number of different realms. Number one, they are, there are disclosures while you're shopping for the loan, when you apply for the loan, and when you sign for the loan. But there are no disclosures when you actually have to start paying back the loan. Number two, we don't know if we are marketing our disclosures to the students or to their parents. And the answer is maybe both. But we have to teach students as well as parents about the, the, the uh, terms and conditions of student loans. Number three, students don't know what to look for. We talked to one student who didn't realize that you could get a deferred interest student loan. So here was this poor soul who was trying to go to school and pay back the loan she just borrowed. Number four, students, it turns out, don't always have a context for the loan. Is a $10,000 loan a lot or a little? What are the payments on uh, a $30,000 student loan debt. Is $350 a month a lot or a little? And another thing we discovered as we were talking to students was that students don't always think about the cumulative effect. They look at it as a series of one at a time loans. So I can afford the loan my freshman year, I can afford the loan my sophomore year, my junior year, my senior year. But I never stopped to think about the fact that I've got four loans that I'm really paying for. Um, and at this point, I do want to mention that the average debt from an Iowa State student on graduation for those with debt is about $31,500, which is actually quite high, not only within the state of Iowa, but also nationally. If we turn to foreclosures, and I know those are on everybody's mind right now, this shows you, again, another heat map for the state of Iowa. The darker the red, the higher the foreclosure rate. In August, uh, there were 725 new foreclosures in Iowa. And um, one out of every 1,800 homes is in foreclosure. And that is up 8.8% from August. The good news, that's the bad news. The good news, let me give you the good news. The good news is Iowa's number 41. You have 40 other states ahead of you in terms of how bad it is for foreclosure. Nevada, Florida, and California are number one, two, and three. Together with Michigan, Arizona, and Illinois, those six states make up 60% of the foreclosures in August. 
So, <laughs> how tough is it out there? Um, let me add just a couple other little happy notes. There's greater complexity in the financial markets. So that mortgages are more complex, reverse mortgages are out there, very complicated products. Annuities are out there, very complicated products. We have to be thinking about how your loans get applied to your credit card when you make the payment, how your checks and transactions are cleared, how debit holds work when you swipe your card at the gas pump and your, your bank automatically blocks $50 on, the, on your, your checking account, but you only pump $30 worth of gas. When does that other $20 get released back into your account? And the answer is not immediately. Um, you've heard people say my 401k is now my 201k. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for frauds and scams when the market is, is as tenuous as it is. And so if this is the worst of times, if this is the, the foolishness and the despair and the darkness, let's try to see if we can figure out what the best of times and the light is. And what I want to do now is not give you tips, not say take the change out of your pocket every night and, and put it in a jelly jar and at the end of the week take it to the bank. Um, what I want to try to do is give you some big picture control, control strategies for dealing with financially tough times. So for those of you who are going to fall asleep during the rest of this lecture, here are the big points right now. Take care of yourself, think long term, Remember, know what tools you have, and remember the basics. So let's go through these one at a time. I couldn't help but focus on the 4-H model when I came to take care of yourself because it is head, heart, hands, and health. And I think about taking care of yourself mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and I would also say financially. So really, you know, you are an important resource in all of this. So taking care of yourself is really very important. The other night at dinner, I mentioned that I see a lot of parallels between physical health and financial health. And I see a lot of parallels between nutritional management and financial management. In nutrition, we talk about eating right and exercising more. And I want you to notice specifically that I didn't say eat less and exercise more. I said eat right and exercise more. It's about Calories in, calories out. Nutritional density matters here. Sometimes you can eat more low-calorie food and, and actually lose weight. So it's diet and exercise. And it's also diet and exercise in spending. Thinking about spending right and earning more. It's all about calories in and calories out for nutrition. It's all about income in and income out, or as I like to say, income and outcome in financial management. Um, there are many, many nutritional management, financial management analogies. Um, in fact, so many that Extension has a program called Small Steps to Healthy Wealth. And their key themes, which are my words, not theirs, are you don't get fat in one day, you can't get thin in one day. So you can get into financial difficulty in one day, you're probably not going to get out of financial difficulty in one day. You have to start small, but you have to start. Think about what cutting out that 3 o'clock soda does, not only for your waistline, but also for your wallet. Even Walmart now is advertising how much money you can save by bringing a sack lunch a couple days a week. And little things add up. If you thought you could save a dollar a day, you would save $356 across the year. If you could save a dollar a week, you'd be saving $52. So start small, but start. The other thing about taking care of yourself really also refers to taking care of your family. And I would encourage you to think about where do your kids think money comes from? When I was growing up, I can remember one of my early memories was my mom taking me into the bank to make bank deposits. I hate to tell you the last time it was I physically walked into a bank. Because what do I do? I use the ATM, I go online. And learning that kind of financial management strategy is very, very <coughs> important in the 21st century. But it disconnects the source of the income 
for the child. And children are very, very concrete thinkers. So the question in here comes, what kind of management, money manager, are you training your children to be? When you go to the grocery store, does your kid think you're buying bread, milk, eggs, and you get cash back? Because what do you do? You say, here's the debit card and give me 50 bucks, right? So what's the message to your kid? Where does money come from? The other part of taking care of yourself is to take care of your credit score. I said this in a class this afternoon. Your credit score really is your permanent record. When, when your teachers tell you, you know, this is going to go on your permanent record, well, your credit score is your permanent record. It's made up of a number of components. Number one, the biggest chunk of it is your payment history. Are you paying your bills on time? Number two is your credit use ratio. If you have a maximum credit line of $5,000, how much of that $5,000 are you using? If it's $1,000, your credit use ratio is 1,000 to 5,000, one-fifth or about 20%. Now let's suppose that your credit card company cuts your credit line. You haven't done anything, but they're starting to get nervous, and they cut that $5,000 line down to $2,000. And credit card companies are doing that these days. What just happened to your utilization rate? It went from 1 to 5 to 1 to 2. Instead of 20%, it's 50%. You are now look like a higher risk to credit companies. Your credit score goes down, and you've done nothing. My advice to you in this situation is start making extra payments on your credit card. Another feature of your credit score is the length of your credit history. And for those of you who are students, you have what is lovingly referred to as a thin file. You just haven't had a lot of history. The longer you have a credit card, the better. And that means you don't surf your cards. You don't go from one card to another to another to another. You need to keep those cards for two to three years in order to build that length of history. Another feature that is in your credit score is the types of credit. Do you have credit cards, student loans, car loans, mortgage loans? What's the mix of credit? A good mix is considered healthy. And finally, what kind of inquiries are on your credit report? How many new lines of credit do you look to be applying for? And here I want to dispel a myth. A lot of people think that when they shop for a mortgage, those are all dings on their credit report, and it means that their score gets lower and lower and lower with every mortgage they shop. And that is not true. Generally, if you shop for the same type of loan within about a 30-day period, it will be deemed that you are shopping for the same purchase. So my message to you is don't worry about things on your credit record if, from shopping. But if you are going to shop, shop efficiently and do it within 30 days. So the strategies that we've talked about under take care of yourself are take care of yourself, take care of your family, take care of your kids, take care of your credit score. The next strategy I want you to, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more thing. That's the outputs of your credit score. How are credit scores used? Sure, they're used to give you a loan. I approve you, I deny you. But they're also used to set the interest rates. We see less credit denials now and more, I'll approve this loan, but you have to pay a higher rate, a penalty rate. So interest rates get determined by this. Your insurance rates, your car insurance rates get determined by your credit score. So even if you're not applying for loans, you might find yourself with a higher insurance rate. If you go to rent an apartment, your landlord can pull a credit report on you. If you go to apply for a job, your employer can pull a credit report on you. And this is really important for those people who are in getting jobs that require security clearances. And this isn't just people who work for TSA or security guards or policemen or people in the military. It is also for people who deal with financial information because the, they have to know that they can rely on you as a secure employee. You're not going to steal anybody's identity. So it's really important to understand how your credit report is used. Okay, now we're going to shift to the next strategy, which is think long term. And while I want you to think long term, I also want to tell you you need to act now. One of the, the real concerns I have is when people lose their job and get laid off, 
They think, oh, I'll get called back, I'll get called back, I'll get called back, and they don't. Um, my sister-in-law happened to be out of a job for close to nine months. She, over the Christmas season last year, was selling shoes at Macy's um, to make ends meet. And it took that Christmas time, this shoe selling experience, to sort of kickstart her into actively going into the job search market. So think long term, but act now. And I have these, these farmers up here um, because to me, it real, the law of the farm really speaks to this. In order to harvest in September, you have to plant in the spring. And so it is thinking that long term, but acting now. One of the things that I've been doing a lot of work in recently in terms of thinking about human behavior and how people can better begin to grapple with thinking long term is to go to the field of behavioral economics. And in behavioral economics, there are a number of features that I think are very interesting and helpful to us as we think about dealing in financial type times. One thing behavioral economists call an endowment effect. And what that is, is it means that we value something more than what it may be worth when we have it. And I read, the reason I put a mug up here is there's a very, very famous experiment done by a Cornell professor where he gave half the class Cornell mugs. And he asked the half the class that didn't have Cornell mugs how much they would pay to buy the Cornell mug from the class that had the Cornell mugs. And then he asked the class, the half the class that had the Cornell mugs, how much they would sell their mug for. So which half of the class had the higher price? The class with the mugs or the class without the mugs? With the mugs. It's the endowment effect. What I own is worth so much more than you could possibly be willing to pay. And that's true for what? My car when I go to sell it, my used car. Oh, it's a, it's a peach, it's a peach, it's worth so much more. My house, it's worth way more than that person is offering me. Um, and, and if I'm on the buying end, oh, that car, it's a lemon, look at all those dings, right? You can't possibly do them. So when you're thinking long term, you really do want to make sure, you have to ask yourself, am I suffering under the endowment effect? Is there something that I'm unwilling to part with or get rid of because I value it too highly? Another effect that comes out of thinking long term is has to do with discounting. We value losses way more than we value gains. We are so worried about losing money that we forget about making money. And so we don't sell off assets that aren't producing for us because they might be a loser and we might, we might be able to get this thing to turn around. Um, and let me give you an example right now. Um, I was saying this to somebody today. Um, there's a personal finance magazine who has been advocating to seniors that because their stocks or mutual funds in their 401ks or IRAs are so low right now, that if they were to sell them off, they would be selling at a loss. They wouldn't be getting as much. So better to let them run and go and take out a home equity line of credit or a reverse mortgage. Because you can pay that back when the stocks go back up and you can sell your stocks. Well, is that really the best financial advice to give somebody? And I gotta tell you, I think it's very circumstantial. There are some people for whom that strategy might work, but there are others for whom it wouldn't work. There's another example of discount. And that has to do with how I value the future versus how I value the present. What we want varies by when we want it. If I were to ask you right now, there's a reception after you, and if I were to say to you, what do you hope is at that reception? A lovely fruit plate or cookies and cake? And if I were to say, you know, next week's university lecture, there's going to be a reception. What would you like at next week's university lecture? A lovely fruit cake <coughs> or cookies and cake? Your answer, if you're like most people, is likely to be, I want the cookies today and I want the fruit next week. <laughs> and one of the interesting things here is that what is the, the behavioral economists say is, 
if we can get people to pre-commit, because they generally make the right long-run decisions, they choose the fruit plate next week. The question is, how can we get you to pre-order that fruit plate now, so that next week when you come back, it'll be there, and you won't have a choice. And let me give you a classic example. I had lunch with a colleague at the Department of Treasury a couple of months ago, and in Treasury, the protocol is you pre-order your lunch. So I dutifully pre-ordered the, the spinach salad. I was so good. I was so good. When I got there, he had pre-ordered the hamburger, and it was wonderful. And if I had the menu in front of me that day, I would have ordered the hamburger. But by pre-committing to the spinach salad, I was being Another thing that behavioral economics talk about is choice architecture. How do we set up and structure choices for people, or for myself even? And in Dick Thaler's book, Nudge, he talks about his opening salvo in the book is he says, I have a friend who's setting up a cafeteria at school, and she has decided to put the salad bar first and the desserts last. Now, what do you suppose would happen to food choices if she flipped those? And if the first thing you saw when you came to the cafeteria was the desserts, and the salad bar was at the end of the cafeteria line. That is choice architecture. What are you, how are you framing the choices? How are you setting them up? Let me give you another example, because I love this one. Colleagues in Chicago at the Chicago Reserve Bank did a study in um, an area of South Chicago where if you were applying for a subprime loan, you had to get credit counseling. By the way, the law was declared unconstitutional because it was um, um, unfair and, and um, deceptive, well, not deceptive, but um, it, it discriminated racially. And, but while it was still in effect, he was able to do this very nice natural experiment study. And he found that people, in fact, got better loans while this choice architecture, while this required counseling was in effect. But it wasn't because they went through counseling. In order to avoid counseling, they sought out better loans. If they had, if the loan had too high an interest rate or too high a fees, you had to go to counseling. So they sought out loans with lower interest rates and lower fees. Um, the reason I have this graphic up here is to remind us that another study showed that when people pay with credit cards, they tend to spend more money than when they pay with cash. So if you're having trouble with your credit cards, put in a block of ice cream. <laughs> another thing that behavioral economics teaches us is how things are framed really, really matter. And I love this ad, buy one, get one, half off everything. Well, is it buy one, get one, or is it half off? In other words, if I buy one, is it only 50% of the price? Or is it only 50% of the price if I buy one and they give me another one? An interesting kind of way of framing it. What we found out is people like free. But corporations don't like to diminish the value of their goods, and so a car dealer it's much more likely to offer you a rebate or a lower interest rate than he is to lower the price of the car. So, you know, you go out to look for a $17,000 car and a $3,000 rebate. Notice that it's not a $14,000 car. It's 17 minus 3. So you're still thinking 17. So framing is really everything. Another thing about thinking long term has to do with what options are you considering? I have a colleague at um, John Lynch at the University of Colorado who talks about your consideration set. And he says a lot of the problems with the current mortgage situation were not because people got more a mortgage, they got the wrong house. And as I was Googling, doing Google images to get pictures for this presentation, I typed in McMansion. And this picture popped up, and then I actually read the text, and it turns out that this house is about five miles from me in Northern Virginia. <laughs> um, so sometimes small can be beautiful, um, that you can go for the more modest house and be just as happy in your 
10,000 square feet as you are in your 10,000 square feet. This goes not just to houses, but it goes to food away from home. Um, what my husband calls the Starbucks phenomenon. Since when did it become okay to pay $4 for coffee? Um, are your eyes bigger than your stomach and or your wallet? Another issue with thinking long term and thinking about the choice set is a dilemma that we face in you want to open up that consideration set to think more broadly. But if you start thinking too broadly, it can stymie your decision making. There was a wonderful study that was done where they went into a grocery store and they set up an example, uh, uh, a sample stand of six jars of jam. And I realize I only have four up there, but so sweet. Um, six jars of jam. People came in and they sampled the jam, and 30% of the people who sampled the jam bought a jar. Next week they came back, they had 24 jars of jam. Of the people who sampled the jam, only 3% off. And the authors of the study attribute this to being so overwhelmed with the 24 choices that they just threw out their hands in indecision and kept rolling that grocery cart down, down the road. And so one of the things I want to say to you in, in terms of thinking long term is, yes, open up your choice set, but open, don't open it up too broadly. And maybe think a little bit about what sustainable consumption is. It really gets down to what do you need versus what do you want. How many features do you really need on your cell phone? And maybe even do you even need a cell phone? <laughs> the other thing I want to encourage you to do, and this, I want to go back now to my rule of the, the law of the farm that says if you're going to harvest in September, you have to plant in the spring. And I want you to think about, suppose you started today saving a penny, and tomorrow you doubled it, and the next day you doubled it, and the next day you doubled it, and so on. How much money would you have by the end of the month? So we start out, today's Tuesday, a penny. Wednesday, two cents. Thursday, four cents. Friday, eight cents. Sixteen, thirty-two. So at the end of the week, you have sixty-four cents a day you're saving. And I venture to say that everybody in here could save 64 cents a day. After 10 days, right, you've been doing a double, 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 double. After 10 days, you're up to saving $5 a day, $5.12. After three weeks, 21 days, this is doubling each time, right? You're saving $10,000 a day. <laughs> After four weeks, you're saving $1,342,000 a day. But notice what happens, the real growth happens at the end of the period here. It doesn't happen unless you start with one cent, two cents, four cents, eight cents, 16 cents. All the compounding happens. I want to share with you, in case some of you have not heard of the rule of 72, and I do not know why this works. But 72 is this magic number that if you take 72 and divide it by the interest rate, it will tell you how long it will take for your money to double. So if your interest rate is 6%, 72 divided by 6, your money will double every 12 years. Okay? I just was balancing my checkbook last weekend before I came here. And I have interest checking at my bank. The interest rate on my checking is 0.05%. And I don't even think I can live that long to see that money double. Okay, so you got to think long term, but you got to start now. Okay? The next strategy, know what tools you have. The first thing is awareness. Pay attention to the world around you. Open and read your mail. Open and read those credit card statements, bank statements, bills. You can be getting notices of change in terms. By the way, right now, today, September 22nd, your credit card company has to tell you 45 days in advance if it's changing any of the terms or interest rates on your credit card. If you disagree with the change in terms, you can freeze the card and continue to pay it off. But if you don't tell them, you want to freeze the card and continue to pay it off. If you never open that change in terms notice, you lose that right because your rate will go up. So pay attention to the world around you. 
get information. And I would hope that you would get information, not sales pitches. And you would seek out trusted third party sources like Cooperative Extension, like the faculty and students, this faculty and staff here at the university. Um, other government websites like the Federal Reserve and the Federal Trade Commission. The difference between education and information is that information is general. Education is how it applies to you. And so I would encourage you to seek out the education to help you apply that information to your situation. Personal finance is, after all, personal. It's not, okay, Hogarth, I got all this really great information from you, but what do I do with it? How do I apply that in my situation? So get the basic tools for analysis, reading, numeracy, critical thinking. And I want to point out that the people in this slide are from an Iowa State Extension program called Annie's Project. And if you don't know about Annie's Project, there are plenty of people in this room who I think can inform you about that. The other thing that's really important, I believe, personally, is to get advice. Um, I currently have some sort of ligament problem <laughs> with my arm, and it was hurting, and I was thinking it was going to go away. So the first thing I did was I self-medicated. I took ibuprofen, right? And there are a lot of financial problems that you can self-medicate for. You can sort of figure out what you should be doing, and then go do it. But after this ligament just kept bothering me and bothering me and bothering me, my husband and I said, how is that doctor? So I went to the doctor and he diagnosed it as a case of tennis elbow. So I now have a very stylish black Velcro thing here that you can't see, but trust me, it's there, um, to help with this tennis elbow. I needed to seek out professional advice. There's, there's nothing, there's no shame in going to a doctor because I have tennis elbow. And there should be no shame in you seeking out really rock solid financial advice when you are beyond the self-medicating stage in your financial abilities. So I want to encourage you to seek out financial advice. But I also want you to choose advisors wisely. Don't go to just any quack doctor, right? You know, I didn't just walk up to any man on the street and say, what should I do about my elbow? I went to my physician. So you want to choose advisors wisely. And here, you guys are so lucky because you have a financial counseling clinic right here on campus. <laughs> and you have certified financial planners here who are able to work with you, talk with you, and help build a financial plan, a financial remedy for you. And I want to point out that this is, in fact, if you can see the square screen up there, funded by the uh, student body. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> the other tool that you have is policy. And remember what Helen LeBaron Hilton said? She wanted to encourage women to get involved and take an interest in policies that affect their lives. If you see something that you think a state or local or federal policy could, implement, could affect, I would encourage you to get active and, and take an active interest in this. Write your legislator, write your congressman, write your senator. Another important tool that you have is you. I mentioned take care of yourself. I would also say invest in yourself. Hone your critical thinking skills. Educate yourself, not just with formal, but also informal education. And I want to use the phrase lifelong learning. Learning doesn't end when you graduate. Sorry about that, students. It really doesn't. You just keep going on. You need to be able to discern when, we, there's a phrase, when it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. You need to be able to discern when it sounds too good to be true. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, an important tool. And I hear I have to say that I my title for my presentation was swiped from this website, so I am not being original. This is the extension.org site, and it is a partnership of all the cooperative extension services around the country. And um, you can go to extension.org, and you can find the link to financial security, managing money in tough times, 
and there's a lot of really great information there on how to talk to your kids about money, on um, developing a budget, on figuring out how to manage your emergency fund, those kinds of things. Another important tool that you have is knowing your rights and responsibilities. So when do you take no for an answer? And my husband said to me, no one's going to get this slide, Jean. But let me explain that this is from uh, a YouTube video called United Breaks Guitars. How many of you have heard of that? Oh, come on. A couple people have, please, sure. All right, go to YouTube tonight when you go home. United Breaks Guitars. This is a professional musician. The moral of the story is don't take off professional musicians. <laughs> but, but this guy put a video up on YouTube because he did everything right. He followed the complaint protocol and he got no satisfaction. So he said, you know, I have a right to some redress here as a consumer. And so he posted this thing on YouTube. It has like 20 million hits on it. And it's very, very interesting to think about guerrilla consumer tactics here. But I would make, say to you, if you're not up to posting your consumer complaints on YouTube, at least lodge your complaints. Um, understand your rights, when you can opt out, when you can, um, if you have a, uh, error, I think most people know that if you have a charge on your credit card that you don't think is yours, you can simply not pay that portion of your credit card. But you can't just not pay it. You have to let the credit card company know that you are disputing this part of your credit card bill. So it's responsibilities, but it's also rights. An interesting website, um, <coughs> CNN has started this site that is um, mortgage nightmares. And people are posting their mortgage nightmares. And a colleague at the Federal Reserve Board sent this site to me and said, you should read some of these stories. So for those of you, I will just send you to this site and say, you should read some of these stories. But it's an interesting thing about how our social networking and social media are starting to become part of our consumer management and financial management strategies. In terms of community resources, I would encourage you to think not only about the ones I have up on the screen, but also your church, social services, food stamps, unemployment benefits, your network resources. Can you share babysitting? Can you exchange videos, books? And please, please, please don't forget about the library. They're the best. OK, the last strategy. Remember the basics. <coughs> Basic number one, shop, compare, and negotiate. When we did our mortgage testing for our disclosures, we found that consumers were more likely to shop around for a cell phone or a television than they were for their mortgages. Almost everybody just went to the first place that they applied. And so when you're shopping and comparing and negotiating, the question becomes, what should you look for? Do you look for monthly payment or interest rates? Do you look for fees or total of payments? And the answer is, it depends on your situation. But understand, do your homework, shop, compare, negotiate. And there are a lot of great shopping tools out on the web. And here's where I get to pitch my own um, advertisement for the Federal Reserve Board. We have a consumer credit website that has a variety of not only consumer information, but also consumer tools. And you'll see on there that there is a survey of credit card plans. And you, we literally twice a year go out and survey banks. Um, this one happens to be from January. The July data are just now getting posted. But you can sort these data by interest rate or annual fee or alphabetically. And you can find out which cards have the lowest rates. For example, in January, the best credit card out there was a uh, credit card that had a 4.2.5% APR and had no annual fee. Pretty good deal. Another basic, please understand the real price of things. So I typed into the Google images, wretched excess. Nothing came out. Um, so 
So I thought, well, a stretch Linnell Homer is probably the most rigidly. I actually found a pink Linnell Homer that I was going to put up there. But, uh, no, I didn't think so. Um, numeracy is really important here when we start talking about the real price of things. I have a colleague from the Boston Reserve Bank who did a study with consumers who use volunteer income tax assistance tax preparation. And he gave people there um, waiting for to have their taxes done a quiz. One of the questions was 600 divided by 3. 50% of the consumers got that wrong. Yeah, that's, that's really very sobering. Um, and people who got that simple question right were more likely to make their payments on time and were less likely to be in foreclosure situations. So it's not, I guess, not just about knowing your numbers, but really understanding the real price of something. What if you really, really shop for something on sale, charge it on your credit card, and revolve it? You could literally double the price of that item. In terms of the Hummers, I would also encourage us to think it's not just about the $3 a gallon for gas for the Truxaurus. It's also the pollution, the environmental issues, um, either whether it's ethanol or oil, it doesn't matter. Um, it's the same for garbage, how many landfills do you want in your county, um, for health, for investments. And I, if we can, more of us can begin to think about the real price of the things we consume, um, we may be led to more socially responsible consumption and more sustainable consumption. We talk about sustainable agriculture. I think we need to talk a little bit about sustainable consumption as well. Um, in terms of understanding costs, let me show you one tool that we have on our Federal Reserve website. It's a credit card calculator. And in this case, we have a $3,000 credit card balance, which is the median for people who revolve, and a 13% APR, which is the average APR right now. And if you fill in those numbers on this credit card calculator page and hit the Calculate Now button, you get an output that tells you that your minimum payment is 60 bucks, it's going to take you 16 years to pay off this $3,000, and you will have paid $2,800 in interest. And economists like to talk about opportunity cost. What, is, what else could you buy for $2,800? And do you really want to give your $2,800 to your credit card company, or would you be rather uh, spend that on a vacation, or um, you know, an upgrade to your house, or um, I don't know, more education at Iowa City. Um, we also, but in terms of the real cost, here's what we do. We give you an option to do some of these what ifs. How do I pay off my balance sooner? If I wanted to pay off my balance in five years, how much would I have to pay? Well, the answer there is $69 a month. And you know, that's not a whole lot different than that $60. Can you squeeze another $9 out of your budget? And look what that does. It cuts your time to five years and your interest paid to $1,000, well, $1,096. Um, what if, instead of making minimum payments, remember minimum payments decrease every month. It's 60, 58, 55, 52, 50, and so forth. If you made those level $60 payments, what would that mean? Well, that would mean you pay off your credit card in six years and you pay $1,300 in interest. So when I say understand the real cost, the real cost of making only the minimum payments is not paying $1,300 or not paying $1,000, but rather paying $2,800. Another basic is to remember that they're called business cycles for a reason. As I was preparing many of these charts for this, this lecture, I couldn't help but be reminded again and again of the cyclical nature of our economy. And I have a lot of faith that we may be down, but we're not out, and we are going to rise again. And this speaks a lot to needing diversification, not only in your investments, but also in your income sources. And many of our families today are able to do as well as they are because we have two earners in our household. There is certainly a role for experience in weathering change in this environment. And I want to close with the final and perhaps the biggest basic of all, and that is spend less than you make. And for this, I have to return to that Hogarth husband, Charles Dickens, 
Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenses, 19 pounds. Result, happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenses, 21 pounds. Result, misery. Thank you very much. Great, inspiring talk. Very informational. I learned a lot. I hope that the audience feels they did too. Um, at this point, I'd like to take time for a few questions. And um, I, I know we're going to always be shorter than the amount of time we've got. So if you could just um, keep any uh, questions you have to that, questions rather than statements. If you want to have a discussion with Dr. Hogarth later, you can do that. So questions? The Federal Reserve is really doing their expected job of oversight of the financial community. Why are there predatory loans out there to begin with? And why are there more payday loan offices in America than our McDonald's franchises? Good question. <laughs> and I think that, um, so let me say two things. I didn't do my job. Um, I didn't issue my disclaimer that saying I'm speaking on my behalf and not on behalf of the Federal Reserve or the Federal Reserve banks or their staff. So it was on there. Yeah, if you could see written disclosures. People don't read written disclosures. They <laughs> um, but I do feel a need to, to, to respond and say, you know, I think there's a lot of money to go around. And I do think that the Federal Reserve and the other federal regulators <coughs> And I think we, we're all in this together. The OCC, the Office of Control of the Currency, the Office of Tariff Supervision, the FDIC, and um, to a lesser extent, the National Credit Union Administration did drop the ball. I don't think we were as assertive as we could have been. Um, the other part of this, and this is going to sound like a Washingtonian making excuses. But there are a lot of entities out there that we do not regulate. And we can't step on the toes of the state regulators. So I want to accept some of the blame, but I also want to share some of the blame. The payday loan thing is a real problem. Um, we did a project with the US Army. And the even though there is a bill, uh, the Tenant Act, that uh, caps payday lending rates for um, military personnel. It is very, very difficult to enforce, and it's often enforced at the state level rather than at the federal level. So I think one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to um, <coughs> continue to support the, the work that your state government is doing in financial regulation. And I would encourage you to continue to write your federal regulator, your federal congressmen and senators, because they are the ones that are going to be making the decisions about how financial services gets regulated in the future. Um, there is a bill pending in front of Congress right now that would change the regulatory structure and create a consumer financial services protection agency. And um, some of these things would perhaps, fewer of these things perhaps would slip through the cracks under such a uh, regulatory structure.
The Federal Reserve System controls all the money in America. All of it is. It's all a private system of money. And they have a mobile economy, and they've got a growing economy. And those two are the vicious cycle. So where with a growing economy, they keep putting more money into the system, into the, into the money supply. It inflates the money, and therefore it devalues it, which means we ultimately pay more every time the Federal Reserve throws more money in. That's the growing economy. And we're always paying more and more and more. We don't know why. It's bankers that are doing it. And they know what they're doing, and that's stupid. Now, as far as the, uh, uh, the mobile economy is concerned, what I've learned, and I don't know everything, and maybe certainly not as much as you do about banks and banks and money and finance, but I suppose after 25 years of looking at it, I probably have forgotten more than most people in this room know. And what you've got is a mobile economy. And again, these bankers know what they're doing. And they hustle the money over to the Middle East, and they know, wow, good times are here. And then, because this is private money, you know, it's the things are private money that property, they can do with it as they please. They can put a lot out there or put just a little out there. They can make us or break us. Arthur Burns said in a Senate committee there, he told them we could break America if we want to, but we choose not to. That's the power the Federal Reserve has over us as individuals and as a nation. What's so the question? question? What's the question? What's the question? I wonder if you could maybe just get to the point of your question as we have, as I instructed. Just get to the point of your question, maybe. Well, the, the point is, how are we going to control the Federal Reserve System if they keep doing this, pulling the rug out from under us? Every time we try to get a stable economy, they keep on upsetting it. This boom and bust has been going on for a long time, since 1913. Well, I am in the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs, and um, I'm not in the Division of Monetary Affairs. And I really have to say that this is it's an interesting question, um, but it's really beyond my expertise as, as a consumer economist person to, to really sort of pontificate about the macroeconomics. I'm really much more of a microeconomist focused on families and households. Um, but I would encourage you to certainly pick up the phone and call um, people at the Federal Reserve and or email them because we do respond to, to questions and concerns. So, um, you know, I would, I can, hopefully you'll be connected with a macroeconomist who can answer your question. It's really beyond my realm of expertise. Sorry. Okay, do we have any more questions? Um, well, I want to begin by thanking you for coming and speaking to us tonight. One question I have is there's been a lot of emphasis and focus on the idea of education and educating our students and our population on how to be financially responsible. Um, from your perspective, what are some of the areas that we do? There's a lot of discussion from K-12 education, whether or not that should be the focus of policymakers, or should the focus should be at the college level, or should it be a mixture, or, and primarily, what, what, or how is it most effective to deliver those educational models? Okay, um, well, you know, I'm an educator, and so I'm going to tell you that education matters. But one of the things we have learned in, in a lot of different studies <coughs> is that um, early learning sticks the most. So the earlier we can get to students with financial education messages, the better. And that's why I really want to encourage parents to really be thinking about the kinds of messages they're sending to their children when they're shopping, doing the ATMs, showing their kids how money is exchanged, because that's how you get your early, early learnings about money. But I believe that early is very, very important. But it doesn't stop. Remember when I said lifelong learning? I truly believe in that. And I believe that there's formal learning can be incredibly helpful. So taking a course in high school, taking a course in college, having a course in middle school, in New York State where I taught, the, um, when, I was, um, when I worked in New York State in, in extension, New York State had a requirement in eighth grade for a financial education module. So all of that really, really helps. Having you all have exposure to financial education here in Iowa State is very important. 
because there are different kinds of teachable moments in our lives. Um, right now, if I were to try to teach you about insurance and annuities, it really wouldn't take. But if I were to teach you about shopping for an apartment, shopping for a car, shopping for a student loan, it would be very salient. And so I think one of the things we have to do is prepare ourselves to be open and understand when those teachable moments happen in our lives, and then seek out the education and the information. So do I believe it belongs in the elementary schools? Do I think math belongs in elementary school? You bet. Do I think reading belongs in elementary school? You bet. Do I think that I can, as an elementary teacher, teach math and reading by using examples from financial education? You bet. Okay, thank you very, very much. I think we'll go ahead and close now. The uh, hour's getting late. And I know it's not the fruit place, but it is the uh, cookies over there. So please stay and, and join us. Thank you very much.